Good evening. Sounds like the singing's a little bit muted tonight. I don't know if it's just me, but I can sympathize. My voice has been a little bit under strain today. I, I'm not sure why. I think maybe because I had a bad night uh, rest-wise, and I think that sometimes affects my voice. But um, let's see how far we get before I fade. And um, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 7 through to 16. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 7. Again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, and has no one, not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cold, a cord is not easily broken. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and a striving after wind. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, give us the necessary grace that we require to walk before you and just to hear and deliver your word. Be with us now, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> if you've ever seen the Godfather trilogy, you will know that it follows the rise of one Michael Corleone, younger son of Don Vito Corleone in the crime syndicate that we call the Sicilian Mafia. Over the course of the movies, Michael's power grows and grows, and the filmmakers want you to believe that he undertakes all that he does entirely for the preservation of his family and largely against his own, own will. However, it is also apparent that as the story progresses, he is capable of ordering ruthless violence even against those who are near to him. And though he professes to want to leave, to get out, his efforts at doing so are not so strong as they appear. First, he wants to stay in so as to get his revenge. Then, so as to retain his newfound power. Then to grow in riches, none of which he is ready to surrender in his professed desire to be legit. And so it is that as the film carries on, like the slave to sin that he is, he continues to live a life of wealth, power, and crime, and in time it costs him everything, absolutely everything. And this is portrayed in two of the most powerful scenes coming at the end of the last film. In one, he symbolically hands over power to a young and ambitious relative and turns to leave the room. But as he turns, he watches over his shoulder as all his previously loyal lieutenants stoop to kiss the hands of the new Don, a powerful replication of a scene from the first movie when it was his hand that was being kissed. And eventually he shuffles away, tired, disillusioned, and already all but forgotten. In another scene, in the dying seconds of the film, he sits utterly alone, old and frail, in a dusty courtyard without anyone to offer him comfort. All his family are dead or have abandoned him. So he sits in the rickety chair, and then he slowly tilts forward and collapses into the dirt, and a dog comes up to his prone body to sniff at it with curiosity, and at that moment the trilogy of films comes to its anticlimactic end. There are scenes that capture well the sort of people that we will read of tonight. The second section of Ecclesiastes, you remember, it began with a poem about providence, sovereignty in chapter 3, and then further reinforced in that chapter with an explanation about eternal purposes. But from verse 16 of chapter 3, Solomon began to introduce a deal of a, a series of things that might cause 
uh, us to question God's control. Supposed anomalies, which are not really a threat to sovereignty at all. And following the example of other preachers and teachers, I liken this to a bus tour through Cape Town. But rather than stopping at the places that are more usually the beautiful sites, we also stopped at places that remind us of the effects of sin and the curse. The first stop might have been the Cape Town High Court where we saw the anomaly of injustice even in that place that's supposed to uphold justice. The second stop was at Maitland Cemetery and Crematorium where we saw the anomaly of death in those rows of poorly kept crumbling graves. The third stop was at the Ezekiel Slave Lodge at the foot of Company Gardens in Cape Town and we saw the anomaly of oppression, past and present. The fourth stop was at the VNA waterfront, which looked pretty good at first, but then we saw the anomaly of envy-driven work, always working so as to shop, so as to match or outperform one's neighbor. And for each of those supposed anomalies, Solomon began to give the, the beginnings of an answer. And for each of them, we would also look to the example of Christ and his teaching, he who lived in a fallen world under the sun. Now tonight, we look at the final two stops on our bus tour of a fallen earth. The fifth stop is Rhodes Cottage in Musenberg. At one time, the home of an immensely wealthy and powerful man, Cecil John Rhodes, having in modern terms close to 15 billion rand, yet who died gasping for breath and without any family around him. His stated reason for never settling down, I have too much work on my hands. And ironically, some of his last words, so little done, so much to do. This is the anomaly of isolation. And we'll look at it in verses 7 to 12. Again, I saw vanity under the sun, another in Solomon's list of vanities, and he describes a career-driven man, a, an ambitious visionary who, like Scrooge, is always looking for more. But his hunger has left him isolated without any with whom to share his life. He has neither son nor brother. And understand that those represent two possible relatives. They would have been the closest male heirs in the ancient world, but in this case representative of any family because it's not only the family, immediate family he has in mind, the actual Hebrew of verse 8 says one person who has not a second, meaning no one with him, no one meaningful, no close human contact, not even a son or a brother. And it begs the question, if enough is never enough, and if he has no one with whom to share the fruit of his labor, why is he laboring at all? Why is he amassing so much at such great cost to himself, foregoing the benefits of human companionship and society? He hasn't even asked himself that question, for who am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? It's a, a single-mindedness that is working for the sake of work to gain more while neglecting others. Philip Ryken, in his commentary, writes about a particular man in the local newspaper that he read of. The man in question uh, had died. He, uh, it was in the obituary. He had worked obsessively hard, died at the age of 51, uh, the cause of death being given as coronary thrombrosis. Yet those who knew him, it said, knew better. At the office six days a week, often until eight or nine in the evening, it was the verdict of his friends and family that the man had simply worked himself to death. Tellingly, two things happened on the day of his funeral, presumably at the, the wake afterwards. First, the company president, probably intending to praise the deceased, was talking about how difficult it would be to replace him and saying that in looking for other candidates, that the question he would be asking was, well, who would be working the hardest? The answer, of course, was the one in the grave. But the second thing that happened, tragically, was with the widow of the dead man who gave a crushing blow. A friend said to her, I know how much you will miss him, to which she replied, oh, I already have. This is the damning verdict of self-imposed solitariness 
which foregoes human relationships and, and also goes to show that it could be found in marriages and families, uh, you don't have to be an eccentric billionaire dying on the Musenberg Coast. Usually the assumption, though, and this is what I'm going to correct, that the assumption people bring to the text is that this is talking about the single person. But hear me very, very clearly now. This is not an indictment against singleness. This is not about marriage. And I sound that warning because so often passages like this are used to bludgeon and target single adults in the local congregation. Now granted there is some application with regards to marriage that comes from this. And again, you know, the gentle assistance of others and pointing a well-suited Christian and man in one another's direction, well, it shouldn't be despised as interfering if it is so welcomed. Uh, many have come to meet their husbands and wives in that way. But these verses are not about marriage. They are not to be lifted out of their context and narrowly applied in such a cruel and clumsy fashion. May I remind you that the most perfect man that ever existed existed is single Jesus of Nazareth and was not Paul the Apostle also single and have there not been many wonderful faithful joyful contented single adults serving the Lord over the last two millennia of the history of the church some of you perhaps will remember Pastor Irving Steggles of Birchley Baptist, recently gone to glory. He was a man whose joyful spirit, whose faithful service influenced countless thousands over his 80 plus years of life. He never married. And he was used mightily of the Lord in his ministry. And this is no surprise. Singleness is held out as a virtue in the New Testament, both in the Gospels and in 1 Corinthians. It is not a disability that needs to be fixed. Now what you have here in verses 7 to 12 is not a discouragement to the unmarried. It's an encouragement to live in community. Verse 8 one alone and no second. Second what? Second person, whoever that might be. Solomon is not describing the unmarried adult, but the antisocial adult, meaning the one who does not live socially, live in community, live in harmony, live in service to his fellow human beings. Verses 7 to 8 are being held in contrast with verses 9 through 12. And quite frankly, there are married couples who would be condemned for their persistent refusal to live in Christian community, just as there are single adults who are heavily involved and greatly to be commended. There are married couples who are raising their children as isolationist, as distant, as far removed from the body of Christ as they are their parents with selfish lifestyles, and there are unmarried single individuals who are exemplary church members actively seeking to give of their lives to others. And that's the point here. It is not against singleness, it is against solitariness. Because the isolationist spirit was never part of God's original intention at creation. It was always a result of the fall. To be, to be broken off from meaningful relationships. To be without holy fellowship and community. This is why it's an uh, anomaly in a world that is ruled by God. To see men and women more concerned with their own selfish desires than with their neighbor who is made in the image of God. And, and if anyone's response is, well, you know, I'm, I just, I'm just a loner. That's my personality. Well, here you go. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Christ. But notice Solomon motivates here. This is not just the stick, this is the carrot. He motivates the superiority of having a second. Having someone with whom to share your life, whether it's a spouse, a friend, a child, a neighbor, or a church community. He says, verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for all their toil. 
And you could read that in two ways. You could read it as part of the illustration. Uh, as working men here, um, uh, you read it as, as a mean of productivity. Two hands, more hands working, the greater the output. Uh, many hands make not just light work, but also make more of the work. However, in view of the greater point of living with others, living in community, living, sharing one's life in the social construct that God designed, I think are more likely that what Solomon is saying is that the messy business of human relationships is worth it. Yes, there are inherent risks with people, heartache, responsibilities, struggles, sacrifice, conflict, time. And yes, to be a part of a church is hard work. This is not heaven on earth. But it's worth the toil. There is good reward. Such as, well, Solomon gives three examples in the next three verses. Things that would accompany a typical business journey in the ancient world, serving as a suitable illustration, but anticipating more situations than just the business. Each of these examples contrasts the individual efforts of one with the combined efforts of two. In fact, the word one is repeated five times in verses 7 to 12, almost, or rather always, negatively. The first example, verse 10, mutual help in times of need. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. I mean, this is why you want someone holding the ladder while you're standing at the top of it. It's why ancient travelers would go together in case one stumbled into a pit, tripped on a rock, lost their footing on a ridge. It's why you travel in convoy when going off-road so you can tow one another out of a ditch or a breakdown. Living in community with others, especially distinctly Christian community of the church, where there is true fellowship, it opens up the door for support. Support that you would never have otherwise have got. It provides you the God-given privilege of helping some of His children when they cry out, Help! I've fallen. Two are better than one. Now often the wealthier the person, the more ignorant of this they are, because after all the wealthy can throw money at most of their problems and they feel they don't need the support of others, which is why some of our members are so far from community life, because you don't appreciate your need of it. And you're content to download the sermon and be fed yourself, but you'll never know what it's like to really serve others, and you'll never know what it's like to be served by them. But the average Joe or Jane Christian knows exactly what I'm talking about. You have heard often how people have said things like, thank God for the church. Thank God for the support of the church in this my time of need. And they mean ordinary members, you helping them. They don't mean some official donation from the budget. They mean the phone calls, the, the, the visits, the, the meals, the gifts, the shoulder to cry on, the encouragement. Thank God for the church, they say. Thank God that I am not just one. But if we take this application even further by making this falling to be of spiritual in nature, how about when you fall into sin? How about when you fall into dark depression and you can cry out help? What happens when there are two instead of one? Well, you not only bear one another's burdens, but you also exhort and admonish and restore one another. This too is the privilege of belonging to a Christian community, to not have to fight your way out of the cesspit, the, the slough of despond, without help. Help that comes from God by His Spirit, yes, but most often through His people. The second example that Solomon gives is of mutual comfort in verse 11. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Now, as often as that is used to describe marriage, and it could certainly include that, it is not the original picture. The original picture is still the context of work and business. Consider that picture. 
Traveling together between two cities in the ancient world without the benefits of high-speed transportation, travelers would walk and then, in the absence of all the camping paraphernalia of modern, uh, uh, modern camping and so on, they would simply find a, a sheltered spot in which they could sleep. But to stay warm, they'd take their blankets, they'd wrap up tight, and then they would lie back to back to share bodily warmth. Now, I realize that sounds strange to us, and I won't be inviting anyone here to warm my back, and I'll thank you for not inviting me to warm yours. (laughs) But there was nothing sexualized in this. It was very common. It's, It's like having a young child climb into your bed during the night and snuggle up in winter because their own bed just feels too cold. So so let's look further at the example and take the meaning out of the illustration. Those living in isolation as one outside of community have no one to comfort them emotionally, uh, or at the the least they have very few to comfort them, and often those comforters are as self-centered as they are. But those who live in community, who toil in human relationships, who go through the hard work of them, have many to lean on to comfort them in times of distress and sorrow and calamity. Again, this is the overwhelming testimony of those who give themselves to meaningful church membership. They have comforters all around them. And in case someone says, well, no one did that for me, yes, I know churches aren't always perfect. Well, they're never perfect in this world, only in the world to come. We're not that perfect. Um, But I will say this from nearly 20 years in churches. Usually, those who are most Earnest in comforting others have no trouble in finding comforters of their own. Why? Because they have good reward for all their toil. They've put in the hard work of relationship building, and when they are themselves in great need, they reap a natural reward that comes of it. And then the third example, verse 12, mutual protection. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, we are not meant to allegorize this into husband, wife, and child, nor Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's not Solomon's point. The picture, again, is of those traveling business partners facing up to a bandit, able to stand together in defense. There's strength in numbers. And if two is good, three is better. It's why you want your daughter to drive with someone on a long-distance trip. It's why you are on the emergency WhatsApp group of your street or clothes. But to take the application and direction that it's intended, it's why you need a spiritual community, a Christian community at your side. So that you may pray for one another in the face of spiritual temptations and danger and attack, in the face of indwelling sin or persecution or false accusation. The Christian is far better off when the righteous are with him because it's easier to stand, isn't it? It's easier to endure, to know that you're not alone, to not have to think of every possible contingency by yourself, to to take wisdom from the abundance of counselors, defense, comfort, help. They flow through this means of grace, the church, where there is not just one and not just two or even a threefold cord, but a whole company of the redeemed. So, So that's the anomaly of isolation and part of an answer. He contrasts it with the the, the benefit of of a community. And we've taken the point. And we've finished now at Rose Cottage in Musenberg. What then is the sixth and last stop on this limited tour of life under the sun? It is Rhodes Memorial. To see that impressive monument set up to commemorate the same man, Cecil John Rhodes, Only upon arrival there, you immediately notice two things. First, half the people visiting have no idea who this guy is. He means nothing to them. Secondly, the other half of people there are cursing him, saying he must fall and celebrate him because the statue has quite literally been beheaded. And so we see the anomaly of fickleness. 
fickleness, variability, fading popularity, if you prefer, uh, forgotten glory. And it's what these next four verses describe. And Rhodes isn't alone. Others from history were once hailed and celebrated, now loathed and despised. And those who are celebrated today will be targets of tomorrow's criticism. Some justly, of course. Just as some are justly criticized in history. I make no comment on that. But even the world recognizes the fickleness of people with respect to their heroes. It reminds me of something I heard in a movie years ago. It was some sort of political drama or thriller or something like that in which the outgoing old president was giving advice to the incoming new president. And he said to his successor, in the top drawer of the presidential desk, you will find two sealed letters. The first time you get into trouble in your duties, open the first letter. The second time you get into trouble in your duties, open the second letter. And so the new president thanks the old president, and they go their separate ways, and soon enough, the new president is in trouble. And he remembers the letters and opens the first. It says simply, blame everything on me. So he does. He, he blames his predecessor, and it works. He escapes the fallout. His popularity is intact. He's on, uh, on track for re-election. But soon enough, he gets in trouble a second time, as politicians are wont to do. And he quickly and eagerly turns to the second letter, hoping to find his salvation. But as he reads it, his face falls because the words inside say, start writing two letters. That's exactly what you see here. The old king, no one rejoices in him anymore. They blame him for everything. They hope in the new king. But soon enough, what happens? The new king becomes the old king, and another king is given savior status in the minds of the citizens, the electorate. Live a few years, and you'll see this repeated again and again in the election cycles. Remember the new dawn of South Africa from just a few years ago? I think we'd agree that enthusiasm, enthusiasm has been decidedly diminished over the last few years. And given enough time, there'll be more new dawns and there'll be more nights that people prefer not to remember. And no matter how many enterprising and charismatic leaders are put into positions of power, sooner or later they will fall short of people's expectations, they will be criticized, reviled, and frequently forgotten. And Solomon is commenting on this here in these verses. Only unlike before, he gives a partial answer in verses 13 and 14 before stating the problem in verses 15 to 16. And you'll see why he reverses it in a moment. The beginnings of the answer, because Scripture has a lot more to say about this type of thing, is found in verse 13. He says, Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice, for he went from prison to the throne, though his own kingdom, in his own kingdom he had been poor. I mean, that the rise from poverty through wisdom to a position of power, it's commendable. It's why self-made millionaires like Richard Branson or Elon Musk are often more popular than those that are born into money. People admire their grit and determination. And in the story, if the choice is between the self-made wise man and the old establishment set in his foolish ways, many will love the one and hate the other. And again, that's not saying that the poor who rise to power are necessarily wise or that rulers that are in power are necessarily fools. Solomon is just giving a story to build to the point. And what is the point? Here it comes, verse 15. There are great crowds of enthusiastic followers for the young man. All the people stand with the young princeling or the newly anointed stranger. He's the star on the rise. He's on the ascension. But... Sooner or later, something happens, verse 16. Those who come afterwards, the next generation, the next election, they will not rejoice in this new king. They've had their fall of him. They're looking elsewhere. Whether he is wise or whether he is a fool, the fickleness of human beings will have its way. This is the anomaly. Popularity always fades. The darlings of the tabloids today are the villains tomorrow. And most especially in leadership, because people are always looking for someone to blame. And who better to blame than the leaders? It happened with Moses. 
when rabble among the people began to stir against him. It happened with David when worthless fellows wanted to stone him. It happened with Joseph. In fact, Joseph may have been who Solomon had in mind. Remember, Joseph started off poor in another kingdom, wandering with his family in Canaan, and then he went from slave to prisoner to the ruler of the land of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh in power, hailed, celebrated by peoples near and far. But eventually what happened? Exodus 1 verse 8, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And the wise young man was forgotten he was not rejoiced over, despite his wisdom. Can you see the anomaly? Wise or fool, you're forgotten. And if you've ever been in any position of leadership in business, in the execution of civil governance, in schools, in churches, in clubs, in societies, in sports, or just with your kids at home, you will know what Solomon is getting at. Whether you lead wisely or whether you lead poorly, sooner or later the fickleness of sin will take heart of someone, some click, and they will not rejoice in you. Why? Because of what you see here in Ecclesiastes. Because in the world's eyes, new is always better. And youth is always idolized. And people have high expectations so that when leaders invariably fall short, the grumblings begin. Now, I don't want to leave you with the wrong idea. This is a general observation about human society. It is not an absolute in every instance concerning every person. The fact of the matter is, though, that we should hope and expect to see this sort of thing far less in Christian circles, in churches, because Christians are not meant to be led by sinful inclinations and ruled by sinful emotions. We're not meant to be fickle or capricious. However, the, the reality, though, is that Satan still prowls. He still strikes shepherds so as to scatter the sheep. He still captures people to do his will, as the letters of the New Testament make abundantly plain. There will still be foolish leaders. There will still be wise leaders. There will still be foolish members. There will still be wise members. But Satan is always on the prowl. And your job and my job is to be like the wise, verses 13 to 14, without letting the anomaly of fickleness mark us as those in verses 15 to 16. That brings us then to the third and final point, the one who knows your struggles and sympathizes with your weaknesses. Now, for the third, third time, we consider the example and continued teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament in the face of these supposed anomalies of sovereignty. We've already seen so far how he felt the sting of injustice in the courts. He tasted the bitterness of death in the tomb. He endured the chains of oppression as he was uh, carried away by those mobs. He was tempted by Satan and his own disciples towards materialistic envy. Yet through it all, he was without sin. Now we see how he was a man who lived in community with others positively, and he knew the cry of desolation when forsaken by others more negatively. You see, Jesus was not a loner. He yearned for fellowship with his Father and frequently retreated to some place quiet to pray. And he longed for his people, loved them, eagerly desired to partake the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He even prayed to his Father in the high priestly prayer, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. I mean, how great was Christ's compassion for people. How great his longing for his bride. How powerful his yearning to be with the church. And how unlike Jesus are some Christians for whom fellowship is a chore and Sunday services are a sprint quickly to be put behind them. Christ Jesus, for whom and by whom all things were made, created mankind to live not alone, but with a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth, the ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly, the body. He created us to be a people, not a collection of scattered persons. 
And he modeled that in his living. He gathered to himself his people. And you cannot be a Christian while in willful isolation. It's just not possible because to do so would require you to purposefully disregard hundreds of Jesus' own commands. So I urge you for the glory of God and the good of your own soul, do not live in isolation the way that some of you are presently inclined to embrace. Do not set yourself apart from the church for the world. Set yourself apart from the world for the church. Christ died for the church. Again, what was the first thing Christ did on being raised? He sought out His people again to meet them, encourage them, teach them, eat with them, bless them. And whom did Christ empower? To, to whom are the, the promised blessings of the New Testament? His bride, the gathered people of Christ. And for whom is Christ coming? Not the maverick isolationist sitting in a bunker somewhere, somewhere stocked up with water, but for His bride. The example is plain to follow. Christ loves His bride, so love His bride. But if you've ever actually felt yourself to be isolated, not through your own design, but by circumstances, or perhaps by the indifference of others, even in the church, because as we said, we're not perfect, Christ can sympathize with that as well. For he bore a burden that no one else could carry but him. He had a cup that no one else could drink but him, despite the boasting of Peter. He felt the sting of abandonment by friends and the betrayal of false friends. He felt the loneliness of the prison soul, the isolation of Gethsemane facing death. His disciples unable even to keep watch with him for about one hour. He knows exactly how you feel, lonely Christian, and is able to provide grace and mercy for your hour of need if you will draw near to his throne. He is a sympathetic Savior. And may I just interject here with one brief personal illustration. When I was converted, I had one Christian friend. I might have told you this story before. Forgive me if I have. I had one Christian friend, and he just got married. And I told you what happens when, new Christians, get, when Christians get married. You, you don't see them anymore. They get married and gone. Now I had no Christian friends. And I was lonely as a young Christian. And, and I, I couldn't fit in with my unbelieving friends anymore. I wanted to be a witness to them, but I just couldn't fit in with what they were doing. I was lonely. And so I just prayed and prayed and plugged myself into the church as best I could. In no time at all, I had more friends than I could count. And I couldn't keep up with the number of social responsibilities. So I put it to you, pray. Pray for friends. Pray for good Christian companions if you are lonely. And get stuck into the church and God will answer you. But then Christ also knew what it was like to feel the fickle affections of emotionally swayed people. Look Look, listen to the, the testimony about Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry. This is interesting. It comes from the beginning of his ministry. John 2, 23 to 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So, popularity, right? But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. See, he knew from the onset what would happen, what people were like. Moses wasn't the only one to be celebrated and hated, nor David, nor Joshua, nor anyone else. The Son of God faced that as well. The honeymoon period of his ministry was brief because quickly opposition arose. But even when we grant that his popularity continued to arise with the crowds, if not the rulers, it was still only three years. Three years, and on the Palm Sunday, they hailed him as king. Hosanna to the son of David. And on the Friday of that same week, they screech with bulging eyes, crucify him. This upstart, this imposter who cannot give us what we hope for, what we desired, away with him. He, we want another king. We want another Messiah. Choose another to take his place. Jesus knows what it's like to face the changing winds of human affections, the capricious support of sinful people. And he can help us weather that storm when invariably it comes our way. 
2,000 years of church history have not changed human hearts for the better. Mankind is every bit as fickle today as back then. Though we pray not in the church. Only remember that while this appears to be an anomaly to sovereignty, as we said all along, there's no such thing, because though it can cause Christians to question, it is not a denial of sovereignty. There is an appointed time for everything under the sun. And God makes everything beautiful in its time, including the fickleness of man. Why then does God let you face it? Why does it happen at all? Well, if you were to go through the New Testament, you could say possibly to build character, to grow faith, to reduce your pride, but especially that we might share in the sufferings of Christ, becoming like Him in His death so as to become like Him in His resurrection. He leads us into the valley of the shadow of death as He was led. He allows messengers of Satan to torment us as they did Paul. He permits companions to turn on us, as they did David. He lets faithfulness be forgotten, as it was for Joseph, but not by him. And why does God do these things? Why does Christ lead us into these situations? Not so that we would be alone, but that so we could be alone with him so that we might know His grace is sufficient for us and His power is made perfect in weakness. And then He sends comfort, most often through the church. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 6 to 7, But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by His coming, but also by the comfort with which He was comforted by you, as He told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. There's Paul in the depths of depression, comforted by the coming of a Christian. Who sent that Christian? But God sent him. So do not lose heart. When facing fickle support of fickle people who are worldly at heart, know that Christ himself stands with you and will be your deliverer in the end, so that your lives do not end with a sad look over your shoulder at the fickleness of man and lost glory like Michael Corleone leaving the room, or not with a lonely tilt into the dust utterly forgotten to be sniffed at by dogs, but rather you will end your life saying, He never left me. He never forsook me. My God is faithful to the very end. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, again we thank you for the example of Christ. We thank you, Father, for the companionship of Christ for the reality of knowing Him, the living Savior. But you know the weakness of our flesh. You know that we are but dust. So draw near to us as we draw near to you. Strengthen us through the means of grace, your word, prayer, and the church. And give us more grace, we ask, for we are bold in coming to you always to ask for your help. Amen.